vision of writing and uh, how do we go about with the starting line? How do we start and develop a fictional voice? And of course, throughout this course, we'll be talking about showing rather than telling how important it is in your writing to show rather than tell. Uh, we'll have a couple of writing prompts with 10 minutes for you to write and read out. Then uh, we'll look at the short story by Kate Chopin, uh, the story of an hour, which I'm sure you've all read. Um, but thank you for your assignments. The assignments kept uh, pouring in yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> there was a sort of a lull during the week and I was getting worried, but by yesterday, they all sort of, there was an avalanche of assignments and uh, thank you for writing. And I'm really excited about your writing because you're in the right direction. Uh, so reading and writing, uh, as we said, go together. They are life skills. Um, before we consider them as art, before we talk about creative writing as art, something we have to learn, we have to be familiar, entirely familiar with reading and writing as a life skill that we do throughout our lives. So when we read a good novel or a short story, we wonder what it is that makes it work. And I uh, mentioned the hidden machinery in each story or each novel. This is what uh, makes the plot, the characters, uh, the imagery, all the components of a short story or a novel come together. So the first step in creative writing is observation. I think this is also um, something I mentioned before. The observ observation is the first step. And the second step is transforming that observation to art. So there is the journal writing where you can record your observations, but then when it comes to actually drawing from your journals and writing your first short story or the beginning of your first novel, you're going to now turn that observation into art. So you have your raw material, and this raw material could be a gesture, yes. Uh, it could be a glance. It could be a mistake that was scarcely noticed. Uh, it could be anything like when you see in a, in a movie how a simple glance might have a significance, the way in which the director presents that glance. So the glance may be full of significance um, or a gesture, a touch here or there, a small mistake that was scarcely noticed, but everything hangs on that mistake. So these are the things that are the raw material, but we take the raw material and we have to make the reader see what we are seeing. So as writers, it's not enough for, to see, for us to see the significance of something or see the layers of significance in a particular gesture or a glance, but we have to enable the reader see that. And we're doing this with words. So you can imagine how important words are, how important the choice of words are, and language is in creative writing. So through writing, you're transferring something very important, very significant, uh, which you have seen and which you want to now make the reader see. Now, um, I don't know whether you were able to get hold of a copy of my collection of short stories um, called uh, Soulmates, but I have a story there uh, called Exile. It's the last story. And uh, in that story, there is uh, a mistake. The protagonist or the central character makes a cultural mistake. Um, uh, in, in that particular culture, uh, she is not supposed to be the first person who enters the compound. She's a daughter-in-law. 
and she has to allow her, allow her husband to walk in, the grandchildren to come in, and she should follow last. Um, but in this case, in this story, she walks in first when she gets off the car and she goes in and she greets the mother-in-law. The mother-in-law is very, very excited that the family has arrived because they've been away for a while out of the country and they're just coming, arriving. So she kind of dances her way to the entrance to greet them. And the daughter-in-law steps out of the car and embraces the mother-in-law, but it is a cultural mistake that she has made. It's a very, um, it can go unnoticed, but the daughter-in-law notices that with one strong elbow, the mother-in-law shoves her aside. Uh, she doesn't return the embrace, but she shoves her aside as part of the dance. It's all like it's this choreographed and nobody notices that this has happened except the daughter-in-law herself. She knows what has happened to her. And then the mother-in-law goes and embraces her son. She embraces her grandchildren. Then she turns around to come to the daughter-in-law. And by this time, the daughter-in-law, her embrace is frozen. She's absolutely, uh, she's not able to respond to that because she knows what has happened. But it's a very small mistake that has happened. And it's something that the writer notices, but you want to transfer that to the reader. So it's very important how we are able to uh, convey what we see to the, to the readers and get the readers to understand the significance without uh, putting it in so many words that it loses that magic. It has to have that magical quality where things are, are conveyed. Now, we have the uh, short story or a part of it, only a, a paragraph of a short story uh, called Trout Friday. Were you all able to read that? Yeah. Do you have it before you? Uh, yeah, I would like to read that and uh, Let's look at it. Trout Friday. It's from a collection called Why Don't You Stop Talking by the author Jackie Kay. So in this paragraph from the story, it says, if you want good teeth, you must brush your gums as well. Gums cause more tooth loss than tooth decay. That's what the paper said. Melanie went straight to the chemist and bought a brand new toothbrush. She'd lost too much already and she was only 23 and she didn't want to lose her teeth into the bargain. She lost her mother when she was 19. She lost her uncle Barry. She lost a baby she was carrying. She liked it if she could read some facts and act on it. Like she read, fish was good for your brain. So now she had salmon on Mondays, prawn on Tuesday, cod on Wednesday, haddock on Thursday and trout on Friday. Weekends, she had fish free because she only really needed her brain during the week. Weekends, she splashes out and has takeaway, picking duck with pancakes, lamb with spicy leaves and naan bread, or Kentucky fried chicken with large fries. Okay, so a short story, what a short story does is that it, uh, it draws close attention to a moment. Uh, we don't have very much in a short story, uh, like in a novel, to develop character, to know what goes on, in the, backs, the backstory and all that. What we have is the moment. Uh, we don't have a continuous complex life history. So the day, the time the story takes place is important because that is all the readers have. Um, what the character does afterwards uh, beyond that story is affected by what happens to her on the day of the story. So on the day of the story, you may just have a phone call. The whole story may be around a phone call. It may be around an unopened letter. It may be around a mistake, like I read from my own short story, Exile. Um, but in Trout Friday, 
we have the the story itself has no dialogue and the passage I read has no dialogue, but it has many voices. It is a polyphonic story. Uh, it has many voices. It has the voice of advertising. You can see that the very first lines say, if you want good teeth, you must brush your gums. This is from the language of advertising. Yeah, gums cause tooth decay. This is what the health professionals will tell you. This is what the newspaper said, and this is what Melanie read. So you have the voice of advertising, you have Melanie's voice itself. Then you have a third person narrator telling us about Melanie's life history. She lost her mother, she lost her uncle Barry, she lost a baby. Uh, so there have been losses in her life. So all these voices overlap. Melanie's loss, Melanie that likes routines, uh, because you find that when she read somewhere that uh, fish is good for your brain, she started eating fish every day. Uh, and all these are different kinds of fish that are mentioned, yeah? So on Mondays, she has salmon, uh, she has prawn on Tuesdays, haddock on Wednesdays, trout on Fridays, and something else on cod on Thursdays, and so on. And the author makes a very sly hint saying weekends she was fish free because she only really needed her brain during the week. That uh, a sort of a, a sly hint at Melanie herself, what sort of a person she was. And then after eating all this because it was good for her brain, she completely let go during the weekend. She would eat all kinds of rubbish. Uh, and all kinds of uh, fast foods and, and Kentucky Fried Chicken with French fries and all sorts of things during the weekend because that she didn't need them anymore. And the newspaper didn't say that she had to take care of herself at the weekend. So a short paragraph, it has a lot in it. There are untold stories in that. There are so many questions that we can answer in that short paragraph. What do we know of Melanie from this short paragraph? Does anybody want to venture an answer? Can you do you want to say something about what um, what do we gather about Melanie from this short paragraph? What sort of a person was she? Any answer? Anything at all? We have two who have raised hands. Hamsini. Yes, please. Up. Yeah. Could somebody, the first person? Um, Hamsini, please go ahead. Okay. So, oh. what I feel is um, when, um, as it is written, that Melanie has lost a lot of people in her life. So, uh, yes. by, uh, by deciding um, what to eat every day, she takes control uh, of what to eat. She controls that part of her life. So I feel yes. she has felt uh, very uh, powerless when she lost people. So she tries to uh, control what she has to eat uh, in a week. So I feel that about her. Excellent. Yes. She's that sort of a person who needs to follow ad advertisements. She has to follow what is in the paper. And that is the only control she has over her life. You know, we, we are told of all her losses. She has lost so many people, but then she goes out and buys a toothbrush. Does a toothbrush make up for the people she have lost? She has lost, but she feels it's important because the newspaper says uh, you know, you need to brush your gums and uh, you need to take care of your teeth. So she goes out and buys an extra toothbrush. And uh, yeah, so uh, sorry, did somebody else have their hand up? Yes, there yeah. is Shweta. Shweta, please go ahead. Yeah, sure. Can you all hear me? Am yeah. I audible? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what I gathered from this uh, short paragraph that I read is that uh, Melanie, she has lost so many things that she's trying to keep things which are very trivial to us generally. Like we don't go and buy a very specific brand of toothbrush, taking care of gums on a very regular manner because we read yeah. it somewhere. We do it unless it is advised. So she's trying to control the aspects of life 
and then yes. she has had very heavy loss where she did not have any control so she feels that whatever she has even teeth or her brain development she wants to control that and keep them safe and uh, yes uh, loss is very heavy and of course control issues somewhere she yeah. lost a lot of control so that's what i have to get exactly yes excellent yeah so i'm glad you're you're following the story and it'll be good for you to locate the story and uh, read it read the entire story it's just a short story in a collection yeah um, but we can see that uh, she has had a lot of losses. She's full of anxiety. Yeah, someone who has lost a lot of things, lost a baby, lost an uncle, lost a mother, uh, has anxieties. And it seems to us as if she lives alone, isn't it? Because we are not told that she has a husband or she has a boyfriend or she's living with someone. She seems to live alone. And she's an anxious person who likes to follow whatever is advised, whether the advice comes from a friend or it comes from the newspaper or from the health guide or health personnel, whatever it is, she goes out and does that because that gives her, as you all said, a sense of control. She has lost control in so many ways that this regularity, this repetition, this organization of her life gives her some control over her life. So that is interesting. Now, oh, I forgot to do my, uh, <laughs> my uh, what do you call this? This, uh, I'm supposed to show you the screen now. Um, Hamsini, what did you say I should do to change this? Uh, oh, I should, okay, okay yeah, here it is. Yeah. yeah, now this is, can you see it? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, this is what I just mentioned, um, transforming observation to art. Can I change the... Yes, Go to uh, we, people who need can take a screenshot of it. Okay, yeah. Then, now this is it, the gesture, glance, a mistake. This is raw material. And I mentioned Exile, which is the title of, of my own short story. And as a writer, you have to make your readers see what you see. Uh, then I have writing prompts. We haven't come to that yet. We'll come to that. Um, Trout Friday. Uh, what do we know of Melanie from the short paragraph? And can we locate the story? You've answered all that. Um, now, the shortest story in literature is in six words. And that was by Ernest Hemingway, who's an American writer. Now, just see that. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. That's it. That's the story. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. It's full of echoes, it's full of resonances, it's full of questions. How does this story resonate? What is it that we're hearing when we hear these, these six words? What does it try to say? Can somebody have a go at it? For sale, baby shoes never worn. Why were these baby shoes never worn? Why are they for sale? What do you think might have happened? We have Shweta. Yeah, I think Shweta. Uh, from the six words, we can gather that maybe the baby was never born or the baby was a stillbirth child. So even though the parents bought things for the baby, they couldn't use it. And yes. maybe the parents have need for money, so they are going to sell the shoes. They feel that someone will buy it for some money and they will get something to get by. Uh, yeah. I think the parents are poor. The baby yeah. was born stillbirth. I mean, the baby was still born. And uh, there is a lot of sadness and loss related to it. Or there can be other side also that they have too much with them. Uh, maybe they bought it for the child. It didn't fit the child. Something happened. Must have they didn't use it. So they are trying to sell it to get some money and to help other people. There are two sides, one good, one bad. 
I think. Excellent. Excellent. Yes, indeed. Any other? Any other perspective on it? We have Hamsi. Yes, Hamsi. I, I, I just, uh, uh, I thought of it as uh, how like Shweta thought that uh, maybe those shoes were uh, uh, bought for a baby and uh, the baby grew out of it. The baby couldn't wear it uh, because uh, they were of a smaller size and the babies and he couldn't wear it. So they just uh, gave it away to somebody who will actually need it. And the baby for whom it was bought had never even used it. So I thought of that. That's good. Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, is there any other? Satya. Okay. Satya. Uh, so I actually thought like I thought this when Hamzini Ridi was explaining. So there the child might be a physically challenged person. Like maybe he was he or she was born without legs and shoes aren't needed for that person. So maybe they put it on sale. Thank you. Thanks very much. So you can see that six words can be a short story on its own in the sense that we have so many perspectives on it. We have so many interpretations of this. Um, it can be that the baby died. We can even take it further and say she was a single mother and uh, she gave the baby for adoption. Uh, we can take it in any direction we want, yeah? The shoes were never worn. Um, she had bought this, but when the baby was born, there were issues. She had to give up the baby for adoption because she was a single mother. Uh, the boy, the young man had left her. And uh, so now she doesn't have money. She needs to put up uh, the shoes for sale. Um, but it's very interesting. And I think this is how stories operate that even whatever, you know, a single sentence can reverberate. There can be echoes. And I saw this in your own writing. It was really interesting. The ones you submitted, you know, there is, uh, there is a lot in, in that. And that was really interesting that there are memories, there are resonances, there are echoes, um, and you were able to pull all this together. So this is by Ernest Hemingway, a very famous American writer, for sale, baby shoes, never worn, yeah. Uh, now, the author, um, generally, not just this author, but any author, when you're writing a short story and you yourself, uh, lets us see and imagine another dimension, the dimension that uh, we would not normally see, but the author enables you through the writing to see it. And that is the difference between telling and showing. So showing, uh, showing a significance, showing a particular thing that is not just uh, telling like journalism, like a newspaper would tell us, but there are other ways in which we are telling in the case of, uh, of creative writing. Yeah, so we read short pieces, uh, which are models, uh, which by different authors, and we learn the craft of writing. Um, we isolate the techniques used by the writers. Um, some writers use metaphors, yeah? uh, symbolism, flashback, imagery, building and fleshing out a persona that is a character, dialogue. Yeah? Metaphor is where you have something standing for something else, you know, like uh, uh, a spring, uh, a natural, uh, the trees, putting out shoots, uh, symbolizing hope, yeah? Uh, so the trees with its fresh shoots become a metaphor for hope in the life of a character. So sometimes we can use those metaphors in our writing. Sometimes we use symbols, one thing standing for another. A flashback is taking us back in memory, yeah? Sometimes a writer may start a story something that happened 20 years back and then bring us forward to what is happening now. Uh, imagery, all the descriptions, building and fleshing out a persona that is a character so that we begin to see that character in a three-dimensional way. The character is not just a flat 
a character on a page, but it is a living character. The character walks off the page. It's somebody we can actually see on the street, somebody we can look out of the window and know that this is a living person. You know, that's the way in which uh, writers do their, uh, what they do with their writing. So how do we mine the material that are part of our everyday lives? So all this is, is a part of our everyday lives. So how do we look at the ordinary world with new eyes, with extraordinary eyes? And this is, the, where, this is where the observation comes up. So looking at the ordinary world, looking at the same scenery from the bus every day as we get to work or get to school, but seeing it with new eyes and seeing new things out there. So from the chaos of the experience, we have to now pick what will make a story, what will make a, a narrative thread and then isolate it and begin to write about it. And one of the things we do is we tap into the resources that are available to us. And one of the major resources is memory. Yeah, all of us tap into memory and recollection when we write. Some of us that have lived a longer time than you have, uh, have longer memories. You know, I can look back to my childhood, it's a long way back. Uh, you too can look back on your childhood, it's more recent, but uh, you can look at memory and recollection and write about what comes to your memory, connect it to what is happening now. Uh, in ancient times, that is before uh, printing of books came about, people actually relied on memory, on visual memorization. You know, that's where you have oral poetry, oral, you know, they had to pass on their writing. There was no writing. So they had to pass it on whatever, poetry or short story or fable there was, was passed on orally from person to person. So memory now is a tool in the hand of the artist. Uh, memory is not like a camera, yeah? A camera captures a photograph. A memory, when you recollect something, you are, it's a very unreliable source, resource. But that's what makes it interesting because it's unreliable. You're not reproducing what happened, but you are adding to it. Uh, you are looking at looking back at it from your present eyes. So your perspective changes what actually happened. We don't know how it changes, but it definitely changes it. You may embellish it, something that is a long way back may look more appealing to you now than what it was then, yeah? So there are so many ways in which memory alters, uh, recollection alters a memory. So that's what retelling is. Retelling a story is actually revisioning it. That is, you're looking at it with fresh eyes, a particular memory, you know, about a particular person or a particular event, something that happened perhaps in your childhood, something that happened. It can be recent memory. It can be a distant memory, yeah? A recent memory can be something that happened yesterday or the day before yesterday. A uh, distant memory can be 10 years, can be even before that. Uh, so there are tricks played by the imagination in recollecting past events. Uh, and this is what uh, I have a quote from a writer called John Banville, he's an Irish writer, and in the book called Time Pieces, he says, how much time must elapse before what merely happened gives off the mysterious, numinous glow that is the mark of true pastness. So when something is past and it's a long way back, uh, it has a mysterious glow about it when you're writing. Uh, about it, yeah? So he's saying, how much time must pass before you can say that that is true pastness? It's something that every writer has to uh, work out for himself. And distance lends sublimity 
to objects and events. So uh, distance make it seem attractive. You know, when you see something far away, uh, there is a glow about it. And that's why when you recollect stories, uh, if you're a brother and sister, two people can recollect the same event or same incident in different ways. Yeah, uh, you might say, well, this is how it happened. And your brother might say, no, this is how it happened. You know, there may be an added dimension or something a little bit different the way he or she sees it. So this is the case with memory. We manipulate the memory for creativity. And uh, that is a good thing. Nobody is going to ask us, uh, why didn't you reproduce it the way it happened because nobody knows except you how it happened and you are free in your writing to use it the way you want to. And so uh, re recalling from the past is like burrowing into a rabbit hole of memory. You're going into the past, burrowing, trying to generate material yeah, from there. So I hope we have some more time. Uh, 12, okay. Do we have 30 minutes? Uh, okay. about, about 30 12 minutes. minutes. About? 12, 12 minutes. Just, just 12 minutes? That's right. Okay. Okay, all right. So let's go to the uh, writing prompts then. Um, the writing prompts, uh, the first one is my favorite tool or kitchen utensil. The second one is, she left me one thing though, lipstick on the edge of my coffee mug. So let's take the first one. Um, I, don't, I want to give 10 minutes for the two pieces. So let's say five minutes, very quickly, see what you can write on my favorite tool or kitchen utensil.
five minutes. Okay, great. Uh, would somebody like to uh, volunteer to read? Hello, ma'am. Yep. Can you I'm hear me? Yeah. The story starts with a cooking passion girl and her best friend. Both used to cook and spended more time to cook. One day the girl quit, quitted a cooking because her parents said it's not a good career to move. And then her best friend moved to abroad before moving. She gifted the girl a knife behind the lipstick on the edge of my on, on the edge of her coffee mug. Um. Sorry, I didn't get the connection, uh, Hamsini. What happened? She moved away. That's Lata, actually. That's Lata. Yeah. Oh, Lata, Lata is it? Yes. Okay. Sorry, Lata, what, what happened? Her best friend got a job in abroad. So mm -hmm. she moved away. Before going, yeah. she just gifted her friend not to quit cooking. She visited her friend and then she left the coffee mug. Mm. No, she I want to a gift behind the coffee mug. She left a gift. Yeah, that's the knife. Okay, okay, okay. She left a gift. Yeah. And the gift was the coffee lipstick on the edge of the coffee mug. The gift was the knife that she left behind the coffee mug which had the lipstick okay 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 but uh, you see the the focus is on the lipstick on the edge of the coffee mug it's not every coffee mug that has lipstick on it so is there something about this person about this um, person i didn't she, see this that. okay okay thank I you you just gave five minutes or just uh, wrote something. Yes, I know. It's too short. Does anyone else have anything on the favorite tool or on the second? Hamsini Shweta. Uh, I would like to. I'm Hamsini. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, my favorite uh, kitchen tool or utensil is uh, a lemon squeezer, wooden or a, a steel lemon squeezer. Because I have always had trouble squeezing lemons. I have this insecurity that uh, if I squeeze a lemon with my fingers, I'm always afraid that there is still some juice left in it. So I don't mm -hmm. want to waste the le lemon. So I feel a lemon squeezer uh, lets you squeeze a uh, lemon uh, to its limit. But I feel uh, a lemon squeezer is like good people in our life or mm -hmm. people generally in our life. Because if pe uh, good people like your well-wishers push you till your limit, uh, but yes. squeezing a lemon uh, too much isn't right either because if you squeeze a lemon beyond its limit, it ends up bitter. So that's yes. uh, that's the case with uh, people who push you beyond your limit. They might yes. uh, end up turning. Uh, I mean, they might end up uh, you know turning you into a into bitter someone person. else. Exactly, a bitter person. Okay, okay. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, thanks. You see, you can see that uh, one sentence can now lead you to think in so many directions. So yeah, you're all on the right direction uh, thinking about this. I wish we could spend more time on the prompts, but right now um, we have... Uh, we have four minutes. So could you take note of the assignment, write a list of things that are important to you, that you cherish, things you cannot do without, or things that you cannot do without. Allow your mind to wander on these items and see where it takes you. So you can write about either one of these things or write about many of them, whichever way you want to do it. Um, but uh, look at the assignment and interpret it the way you would like to and write maximum 500 words for next week, okay? Um, now that was that. And uh, there's a list of, uh, uh, I gave a reading list. This is not for now. This is for ever after, later, <laughs> when you would like to read. You can just take a, a shot of it uh, and then if you can find it, 
you read some of these short stories. I think they are very interesting stories. Um, we haven't had time to look at Kate Chopin's The Story of an Hour. Did you enjoy it? How did you feel about it? Was it a shocking story? <laughs> Is there a twist at the end? <laughs> yes, ma'am. There is a twist at the end. Did you know from the beginning that there was going to be a twist? Did you know what the outcome was going to be? No, ma'am. No. So the story, or the whole story takes place in one hour. That's why it's a story of an hour. And it's written by Kate Chopin, who was a late 19th century writer, American writer. And she was a feminist. Um, so her stories generated a lot of controversy because at that time, women were not allowed to explore in all these directions that she takes the story in, you know. Uh, talking about husbands in this way, talking about freedom, talking about a woman being oppressed or suppressed. All this was not permitted in those days. So she was, uh, she, her stories generated a lot of controversy on account of that. So you can see that there are three segments to the story. The first one, the news is broken, that the husband is dead and he died in an accident, a railroad accident. The second part of the story is her reflection over what has happened, the news and how she takes it. And the third part is the unexpected outcome. When somebody opens the door with a key and the husband comes in and what happens is that the husband was supposed to have died, she drops dead at the end, yes? So a completely shocking, outcome. But you can see that the author drops a hint with the very first sentence when she says, Louise Mallard had a heart condition. Yeah, she says that in the very first sentence, and we overlook it, because we are anxious to see what the story is about. So it's only when we go back and see, she has dropped a hint that uh, Louise had a heart condition. And so her friend and uh, her sister and her husband's friend break the news gently to her that the husband has died. And then quite unexpectedly, we find her reflection on this uh, when she thinks about it. After she has finished crying, she now looks to the future, a future by herself. And the words that escape from her mouth are free, free, free. So it gives us an idea of the relationship between the husband and wife. What kind of relationship was it? That's the question we ask. Then in the end, uh, when she's coming down with her sister, the least thing that we expect is for the husband to walk in. And we are now told that he was far away from the scene of the accident. It was a mistake that his name was included among the list of those who were killed and he walks in, but she has a shock and the shock triggers a, a heart attack and uh, she dies. And it's really interesting that the doctor says she died of joy that kills. <laughs> so she was overjoyed, the doctor says, and that's what killed her. But we, the reader know that that was not what killed her. It was the shock on seeing the husband because she has been, uh, going over in her mind of different things. Yes. Is there any other contribution you would like to make to that story? No, no. Anita? Anita, did you want to say something? No, no, no. Uh, no, no. I was just uh, saying exactly what you were saying. Yeah, it was totally the opposite of what. Yes, totally unexpected what happens. Okay. Okay, so we will post on the uh, creative writing uh, chat anything, uh, the things you have to read for next week, but go ahead and do the uh, assignment and please submit it. Okay, yes. and we will continue where we left off. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kanchana, and thank you very much, you. everyone, for joining in today. Thank Look you. forward to seeing you next week. Do send in your assignments well in time so that Kanchana can have a look at them and we are able to discuss it as well in the class next time. Look forward to seeing you. Thank you so much. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.